Classic Rock 94.9 and 104.5. Shaggy here interviewing the one, the only Brian Bassett, guitarist of Foghat. How are you doing today, Brian? I'm doing great. Getting ready for a plane trip up up your way. That's true. This Saturday, correct? That's right. It's going to be a rocking time. Yeah, I'll say so too. Now, I just wanted to ask you a few basic questions, you know, kind of get to know you a bit. You know, I'm pretty familiar with your career and I'm a big fan, I just have to say. But for those of the listeners who do not know who you are, you've actually been in quite a few bigger bands throughout the years. One of them who really took off, uh, one of your first bands was Wild Cherry. Yeah, it was. Uh, that would be uh, about 1976. So we had a big hit, Play That Funky Music, White Boy. <laughs> I just have to say, that is my go-to karaoke song at the karaoke bar, and it is always a huge hit, so I appreciate the uh, rock and guitar rift on there. <laughs> I get to hear that sometime. <laughs> yeah, we were real lucky with that one. You know, sort of a tongue-in-cheek uh, song, you know, a little bit funny, but also pretty autobiographical of what happened to us. We were uh, a club band playing rock and roll music and uh, music tied, shifted into funk uh, style music with the Commodores and uh, KC, everybody coming out with dance music. So we took a shot at it and uh, we're very lucky with that song. I mean, did you think that it would go and blow up like it did? Uh, No, actually, you know, we actually financed it ourselves. Uh, We really, at that time, there were still jukeboxes and 45 vinyl going around so our you know our initial aim was just to record an original song and get it in the local jukeboxes so we could jack up our, our club prices a little bit and uh, and change our style of music into dance music so we could continue playing the club but we were lucky to uh, run into a record executive who took the song to New York and and literally about 6 months later it was on the charts so we were pretty blown away by the whole thing yeah that's amazing so it definitely all worked out for you guys yeah we were you know we had uh, Belkin Brothers, who were a big promoter uh, company up in Cleveland, took us under their wing, and uh, due to their their uh, influence in the concert business, we were able to get on some really great tours. So we played with Average White Band, the Commodores, Earth, Wind, and Fire, I mean, all the great R&B acts of the day. Uh, so yeah, it was real exciting for us young guys. Tell me, how do you go from Wild Cherry to being the guitarist for Foghat? Well, it was sort of a uh, circuitous route there. I actually uh, left Wild Cherry around 79, 80, and um, started a band in Pittsburgh called uh, Airborne, which was more, I'd say we were more like oriented to like a sticks kind of band. So I, I left uh, the funk thing trying to get back into a rock and roll sound. And um, we did that for a few years, quite successful regionally, but never secured a record deal, which was very important back in those days. You really couldn't, there was no internet, you couldn't self-promote or anything. So I moved to Florida, um, got involved in my other passion, which is recording engineering. I worked for a a company called Kingsnake Records, where we produced Roots music and mostly American blues. Um, We were doing, no, for a period of about 10, 12 years, we were putting out 10 records a year for um, blues artists. So that was really uh, a lot of fun for me. I enjoyed uh, being behind the desk and recording, and I was a session guitar player as well. I had a quartet uh, called Blue House that we played the uh, Central Florida area. I had left the Pittsburgh area and relocated to Florida. Um, Pat Travers, the great guitarist uh, and a friend of our bass player at the time, brought Lonesome Dave to one of our shows. He was a big blues fan and a big blues record collector. We hit it off as friends, and uh, when he decided to go out on tour, the original guitar player, Rod Price, uh, was in retirement. He asked me to tour with him, and um, that sort of brought me into uh, the Foghat family. And that was about 1989. Uh, After that, um, about uh, 92, the original guitar player, Rod, came out of retirement at the behest of the great producer, Rick Rubin, uh, who wanted to record all the original Foghat uh, members. Um, and so at that point, we had just completed a tour with uh, Molly Hatchet in Europe, and uh, I became friends with them, and they asked me to join their band. So I went from funk to uh, blues rock into southern rock for seven years. And uh, and then when Rod retired again um, around 1999, I came uh, back into Foghead and been here ever since. So that's going on 17, 18 years now. That's a long time. I mean, you've had a great time in this band too, haven't you? Oh. I sure have. You know, there's, uh, Roger Earl is, uh, you know, the original drummer and c- continues the legacy of the band for, you know, several, you know he's been there since uh, he left Savoy Brown in the 60s. So oh, yeah. uh, I think uh, Foghat was established in 71. So uh, he's been there the whole time and he's just a great guy to 
one of my best friends in the world, and um, myself and Charlie, our singer who uh, took Dave's place when he passed away, yeah. have been together, you know, 17 years now. So it's just a great bunch of guys to play music with, and uh, we're best friends, and we enjoy traveling around the country rocking and rolling. When Dave passed away, was that a pretty hard transition to get a new lead singer? It was very difficult. Uh, in fact, we had, you know, discussed not doing anything. Uh, although Dave, one of my last conversations with him, he asked me to keep it the band going and keep playing with Roger. Uh, and basically his exact words were, Foghat's been very good to me and my family, and I hope it is for you, so keep on going. And he had uh, seen Charlie. Charlie was a former singer with Ted Nugent, but they, uh, Dave had seen him play with Humble Pie, oh, yeah, um, yeah. where he was doing Steve Marriott's um, you know, songs. And Dave was impressed with him, his vocals, and really, uh, Roger got in touch with Charlie, and we really didn't audition anybody else. It yeah. was, uh, we met Charlie, and he it was very similar to Dave and you know, in talent, uh, but not really a Dave copycat, which we didn't want. We want someone with their, you know, Dave's sensibilities, but had their own personality. We went to New York and rehearsed with Charlie, and that was pretty much it. So he was approved by Dave. He was, exactly. So it was that, you know, I mean, that's where Roger remembered uh, that Dave liked Charlie singing, and so we went to him first. You know what, that's great, and, I, and I'm sure that's pretty comforting in, in the same way as well. Yes, it is, and it was, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's we're pretty tight-knit family, and, um, you know, I, I knew Dave, and, you know, so I, he brought me into the band as well, so, uh, you know, we've... Have, there's been, I think, three guitar players really over the years. Myself, Eric Cartwright, uh, we played for some years after Rod left initially in the 80s, and then myself. So, uh, you know, it's, it's just been uh, sort of a progression, but mostly through friends. Now, other than Fog Hat, Molly Hatchet, Wild Cherry, it seems to me that you've performed with pretty much just about everyone. What were some of the highlight performances of your career? Well, it's one of my favorite. We played uh, Pittsburgh Civic Arena two or three times in Wild Cherry with my parents in attendance. So that was, that's always, it was a highlight for me to, uh, you know, I turned down a really good college scholarship to play football back in the, you know, in the seventies when I got out of high school, it was a Carnegie Mellon scholarship, which was quite a prestigious school. And I, I turned that down to go play with a band in a, con we lived in a condemned building in uh, Lima, Ohio <laughs> with a bunch of guys. So my parents, you know, you would think they would have lost their mind, but, my dad was an artist at heart, and uh, he said, well, this is, you know, this is what you want to do, go for it. So I was really happy to uh, do some prestigious shows with them in attendance. So that's always has been a, you know, a, a great memory for me. And and then, uh, you know, I met Stevie Wonder. Uh, we opened uh, the show on a Jackson 5 tour, their very last family uh, tour. Did a couple shows with them, so that was pretty cool to see Michael Jackson, you know, from this side stage quite a you know spectacular performer oh, yeah. when like you know he's probably in his early 20s and this is before he went solo so uh that's a great memory uh the average white band was some of my favorite tours ever i mean we would play before average white band and i would change my clothes and run out into the audience to watch them perform every night so they were fantastic <laughs> and there's some really great live recordings of them on uh, youtube that you can check out but man what a great band they were amazing so stuff like that yeah. i mean the, the musicianship and camaraderie of musicians back then was spectacular and I you know, got to see so many great artists perform. Now here's a question I always like to ask. Throughout the years you've been on tour with lots of bands, you know, lots of different opening acts. I'm sure you've opened for a lot of great bands. Who is a band that you have loved touring with in the past and who is a band that you absolutely despise touring with? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm quite the music fan, so I, I can't say I actually despise uh, anyone that I can think of. That's a pretty harsh word, but I mean, I, I toured a lot as a member of Foghat with Blue Oyster Cult, and uh, we had shared the same agency for many years, so we became very close friends. So I always loved playing with them. The guys in Cheap Trick are fantastic. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, 38 Special, you know, we've done some shows with them, and uh, their drummer lives very near me here in uh, Central Florida. So they're good friends. It's, it's, uh, you know, touring now is way different and you know, it's not as competitive as it was when we were younger. So now it's when you see people, it's, uh, you know, hugs and hey man, how you doing kind of thing. So I, I really like that about it. Just being 
friends and peers with people that I admire. So that's been great. Um, I can't really remember too many bad experiences, you know, not coming from the band. I know when we opened up for the Jackson 5, they had this giant, like, hydraulic star that we had to find a way to stand on. <laughs> <laughs> and it would always malfunction when it would, like, lift up. It, it would act, you know, every once in a while it would tip the wrong way and we would basically fall off of it. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy things like that, you know, just stage, you know, and, you know, not not really uh, from an artist thing, but just malfunctioning stage props. So those, those were always hilarious. So a, a few you know, spinal tap moments. Bomb. Yeah, flash bombs going off underneath the piano, which basically blew the piano up. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> I watched the, our, our, we had a Yamaha grand piano. I, you know, at sound check, I saw a forklift pick it up, go up about 12 feet, you know, put it on the stage and then drop it. And it smashed into a million pieces. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, you never know how many pieces are in a grand piano until you see it explode when it hits the ground and it turns into a big pile of lumber. <laughs> so that was, yeah, the crazy things like that I remember. Um, but, you know, most artists are, are pretty cool, you know. I, I can't really say I despised anybody. Well, that's good to hear then. No bad blood between you and any other bands. No, not okay. really. You know, I mean, some people were more standoffish than others, but, you know, that, a lot of that subsided in the 70s and 80s, and, and everybody now is, is, is pretty cool, you know, and it takes time to check each other's show out. We do this uh, cruise. It's called the Rock Legends Cruise. We've done three or four of them now, and we're getting ready to do one at the end of the year. And there's like 20 bands on there, so that's fantastic because not only do we play three concerts but we get to see you know dozens of concerts uh, this year roger daltrey's on there and, oh that's fun um one of the guys from the kinks is on there you know and then once again 30 special i'm really good friends with the band kansas so i get to see them perform a couple times so events like that are i really look forward to now where i not only do i get to play but i also get to see and and say hi to a lot of my friends in the music industry. Well, great. Yeah, that sounds like a great time. I mean, especially, you know, being on an isolated place like a cruise ship, that would be a ton of fun. It really is. And uh, and it's for a great charity, too. It's for uh, Native American uh, ch you know, children's charities. Oh, great. They've been doing it for several years. It's called NAHA, um, N-A-H-A. And uh, it's a fantastic charity. And and a really great rock and roll experience, too. Now, I'm a guitar player, like you, obviously nowhere on your skill level, but I'm still a guitar player nonetheless, so I'm always interested in hearing kind of how your guitar preferences have changed over the years. I mean, have you been pretty consistent with the type of guitars that you play, or uh, have you found something that you like more as your career has progressed? I actually am very old school, and I play essentially the same setup and the same style that I have ever since I began playing. In fact, I always lament my uh, losing some of my early equipment. I, my very first setup was a 68 Gibson Gold Top and a High Watt 50. Which, oh, nice. Uh, you know, I, I sold over the years both the guitar and the amp. And, and But still, I'm still playing a Gibson, and I, I, I play a Schecter uh, PT, which is sort of a, uh, you know, a, a jacked-up Telecaster. Yep. Um, and I don't really use very many pedals. I have a Wawa pedal and a compressor and... And that's about it, plugged straight into the amp. I don't use any distortion pedals. So, uh, you know, if I have a really good Marshall amp to play through, I'm pretty much good to go. And I really haven't changed, you know, that, you know, my whole career. So uh, I save myself a lot of money by not having to get into, uh, you know, into buying multitudes of pedals. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Pedals are so expensive these days. It's ridiculous. But yeah, I, I often wish, you know, I listened to old tapes of my club band from back in the you know, late 60s, early 70s when I had that. A Les Paul high watt rig. I'm like, why did I ever sell it? <laughs> I'm still chasing that same exact sound, and you know, it sounded great then. And oh yeah, I wish I had it back. I'd probably still be using it. It's always the constant search for that perfect sound, right? Exactly. Now, if I recall right, you're a, a Gibson SG man. I am, a, you know, which is uh, for slide work, and I play a lot of slide in the Foghead Show. Of course, it's such an integral part of our sound. And Rod Price was a brilliant slide player. Um, so, you know, SG, most slide players you'll see playing that, and it gives you access to the upper frets of the neck, mm -hmm. and I think that's why most guys like it. Um, you know, Derek Trucks is brilliant, and he plays an SG. Uh, you know, Dwayne played both the Les Paul and an SG. So, you know, I've used an SG for slide ever since I joined the band. My personal preferred guitar is a uh, Gibson Les Paul Jr. Have you played those at all? I do. I actually have a, uh, a 57 oh, beautiful. Uh, Jr., an old one, and uh, I do like them quite a bit. And 
uh, I've heard uh, an old friend of mine from Pittsburgh used to play uh, that to an old uh, blonde concert, play slide on a Les Paul Jr. through the concert amp. And that was a beautiful sound. So, uh, you know, you really can't go wrong with a vintage, you know, Les Paul Jr. and any kind of good amp. So that's a great sound. Oh, yeah, yeah. They just have this natural, heavy sound to them, and I love it. And Leslie West, uh, you know, to me, I consider him one of the great tone masters, you know, of rock and roll. And I think his early setup was uh, Les Paul Jr. as well. What was the first guitar you ever got? A Harmony Rocket One. All right. It was a... uh, yeah, it was a big red uh, guitar with white knobs, and I had the single pickup version. As a matter of fact, I just bought one off of eBay about two or three months ago. To uh, I'm rebuying guitars of my youth, and uh, and it plays sort of like a 335, uh-huh. and uh, you know it's a little beat, but um, but that was my first one, and that's what I learned on that a little harmony guitar. I think some of the guys of the black uh, the guitar player for the Black Keys. Started playing one, and the price went from like two hundred bucks to a thousand bucks. Oh man! <laughs> so when I started looking for them, I was like, "Man, I can't believe these things are you know so expensive." But uh, and you know, guys like Jack White and uh, and Arbuck from Black Keys started playing the you know like off-brand vintage guitars, and uh, so it sort of you know they became collectible. That's what happens when those guys start picking up things. Yeah. Now you guys are coming this Saturday in Burley, Idaho to play the first Rock in the Snake. Have you guys had some pretty good support in Idaho in the past? We have and we love going to that part of the country. I mean, we always have good crowds and and generally we play during the summer with, you know, different outdoor festival events. So the crowds are always great and, you know, weather permitting everything's wonderful yes i i love that part of the country i'm you know we're very looking forward to going up there i wish we had a day or two to just hang out and go you know see some of the sites but we're sort of in the middle of the tour so we'll be in and out but yeah i really look forward to it and that's a, it's a great rocking crowd up there definitely i mean we in idaho love our classic rock so uh, we're glad to have you now you guys are in the middle of a huge tour right now you're going on tell almost next year aren't you we do and uh and it's not unlike every year we're a pretty much all year around touring band although yeah. unlike the past where we would get on a bus and do circles around the country for five or six weeks and then take a break we uh mostly fly everywhere now and we're more like weekend uh warriors where we'll go out on a thursday come home on a sunday or monday and have a couple days at home but we pretty much do that all year long so it all works out you know you get to go home and see the family and friends and tour on the weekends exactly yeah it's, it's a nice uh, kinder gentler way to travel last question for you so these days it, it seems like so many bands don't have all of the original members in them i mean for example like kiss and leonard skitter but they still manage to have a lot of success and so do you think with roger earl being the only original member of fog hat right now do you see any blowback from the fans, or have they been pretty supportive over the years? They've been very supportive, and truly, that's the key to it. I think our attention to detail with playing the songbooks and um, and our acceptance by our fan base, that's what makes us be able to continue to, to tour. Um, you know, Dave was my best friend, and, uh, you know, Rod passed away as well, so, you know, every once in a while you'll talk to someone, and then... They have that original band thing, which I just say, thank goodness, that's why there's recordings, you know. uh, We can all listen to the original band recordings and enjoy Dave and Rod's playing. But for people that want to experience the music live, we really spend a lot of time and a lot of rehearsal time paying attention to details to try to get the music right so everybody hears as close as possible to what the original recordings were. Plus, we sort of have the same spirit of improvisation and love of blues rock. So we don't, you know, never tried to change the style of the band. We mm-hmm. uh, have put out a lot of records over the last several years, and and really at this point, this band has been together longer than the original band. But yeah. you know, as far as original versus replacement players goes, that's not really, you know, part of the equation. But I admire ba- uh, bands like the Allman Brothers. I two great guitar players, Derek Trucks and Warren Haynes, came in and. And, you know, really maintained the level of the band and played the original songs fantastically, plus brought their own, you know, originality to the mix. So that's, you know, kind of the way I look at it. I mean, Roger is the original guy all the way back to the beginning, so he certainly deserves to play his legacy. And I'm just glad to be a part of it. And uh, and like I said, I you know, Rod was a friend of mine. 
I got I, we actually played as a five piece for a while uh, on uh, the twentieth anniversary when we went to Europe uh, as a five piece, and oh, I got fun. to stand next to Rod and sort of got a master class and you know what eventually would be my chair. And uh, so that was fun to see him play slide up, you know, up close and personal and see how he did it and, and, you know, learn his technique and try to apply it to my playing. So that's the way I look at it. As long as our fans, you know, enjoy the show and get to hear the great songs that they love and we do, you know, a respectable job of doing it, I think everything's cool. So that's that's the secret to me, you know, uh, bands' attention to detail and and the fan base uh, accepting it. And you know what? I would agree with you. And I just have to say, I think you guys are doing a civil service, keeping rock and roll alive. So thank you for that. Uh, well, we're certainly uh, pleased to do it. You know, I mean, I think we'd probably be doing it no matter what. And, and uh, just for the fun love of playing and, but to be able to still tour and have uh, good crowds come out and see us is a blessing. Well, hey, thank you so much, Brian. I, I really appreciate it. Like I said, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but... Looks like I already took up 23 minutes, so thank you so much. <laughs> well, that's my pleasure, Shaggy, man. Thanks for the call. Hey, no problem. Good luck with the show and safe travels as well. Once again, guys, you can catch Fog Hat this Saturday at Rockin' the Snake in Burley at the River's Edge Golf Club. If you haven't got your tickets already, then go to their website, rockinthesnake.brownpapertickets.com, or you can get tickets at foghat.com or 949therock.com. Once again, Brian Bassett from Fog Hat. Thank you so much. Hey, we look forward to it. Let's do some rock and roll. Oh, you know it. Rock on. All right, Shaggy. Take care, brother. Hey, great. Thank you so much, Brian.